Hey there. Uh, hi there. What's your name? I'm Brian. Hey there. What are you exhibiting? I have a Amiga 500 in a Checkmate A1500 Plus case. So what? this is an aftermarket case that you can put the Amiga 500 into. And what kind of goodies do you, are you running here? I have an accelerator. Um, I'm not sure the full name of it, but it's a 533 something. And it's got a 33 megahertz, 68,000 processor, 8 megabytes of fast memory, and an IDE controller built into the accelerator. What kind of things do you do with your Amiga? I call BBSs and I play video games. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, well, I have you. a Wi-Fi modem for the oh. BBSs. Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey there, what's your name? My name is Luca. Hi there, Luca. Uh, what are you doing with your computers here? Oh, yeah, so I have a fantastic Commodore 128D, PAL, European one, yeah. bought in Germany. And I'm running a video game, Eye of the Beholder, where you can see the map on the left monitor. And the game itself on the colorful right monitor is Eye of the Beholder running on dual monitor on an 8 bit machine. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, you can see basically the maps. Oh, yes, there it is. There it is. It's going to be moving. And I can see basically where am I. You see that the blinking cars are there. And uh -huh. they're moving up, up, up. I'm gonna left, and I go back. But I think so. This is basically a unique video game running on two different monitors. On this side, I have the fastest Amiga ever, V4 Vampire standalone. And I'm upgrading the core of the FPGA, which I already done. But also, I want to update the Saga, the super. AGA system for matching the new core that they got onto it. So I'm gonna just run the installer and if you look at it, this is the actual installer. Oh, okay. Yeah, and trying to not screw up the system <laughs> and be prepared to roll back if anything is gonna go wrong. And what do you like to do with your, your vampire? Oh, well, just messing around, playing, and some days maybe writing some software. Oh, writing Learning. software. Learning. Very Learning. good. 68K Very good. assembly and oh, something wow. like that. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Robert. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Hi there. What's your name? Hey, I'm Bernie, and I'm a long-time Amiga user. Oh, OK. What are you doing with your Amiga OS 4.1 SAM? Uh, well, this is, um, I resuscitated this board uh, just last night. Um, it's a very unique Amiga. It has a PowerPC CPU. It's um, 450 megahertz, I believe. Um, it, it runs Amiga OS 4.1, which was uh, you know, compiled off the original source code, but ported to the PowerPC. Um, this system, I installed the system maybe 10 years ago and then not use it much. So now I'm trying to relearn how to get on the internet with it. Um, I'm not online yet, but I have, I have it hooked up to the local network. Um, it runs uh, like the, the thing that's uh, that's kind of very obviously visible is that it's a 24-bit true color screen with um, you know <coughs> shadows on the windows and uh, the windows fly really fast. So it has hardware acceleration for the graphics card. What do you like doing with your Amigas? Well, I was once a coder and I have um, like a music tracker called the X module. And uh, I would like to get the code uh, on this new board and uh, get a compiler and see if I can get it to work on PowerPC. It will be much faster, much better. Okay, thank you very much, Brady. Hi there, what are you doing? Uh, what's your name, Ed? What are you doing with your exhibit? My name is Mark Redden. Um, I'm exhibiting the Commander X16, uh, which is a, a new retro machine by the 8 bit guy. Um, it's been developed over the past few years, and recently, this past week, actually, they've sold their first batch of this demo, oh. or excuse me, developer board. Hmm. Um, uh, and then this uh, one over here is actually a, a clone of the of the commander that was uh, 
put together by uh, a guy named Joe Burks about a, about a year ago. And so he's been keeping up with the the pace, and also he, he helps out a lot with the the rail developer board as well. But uh, yeah, so just kind of as an enthusiast, just kind of showing it off here at the show. Um, what can you do with your commander? Um, it'll run a lot of, it's an 8-bit machine, um, right here someone's done an actual port of Super Mario Brothers that's running there. Um, the 8-bit guy himself has written uh, some games for it as well. Uh, Petsky Robots is, is one of those, we can actually run that here if you like. Oh. Let's see. Oh. And it's it was intended to be kind of a spiritual successor to the uh, Commodore VIC-20, Commodore oh. 64, you know, their 8-bit line. Yeah. So it's, it runs at 8 megahertz, it's got very good graphics, it's got three sound sources, uh, one of them being a Yamaha synthesizer chip. Oh, wow. Uh, let's see, we can... There it goes. And there's the game running. There it is. All right. Yeah. So it's a it's a fun machine. Um, has basic V2 built in. You can also do assembly language. Um, and there's other compilers and cross compilers mm. that are being developed for it as well. Mm. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Hey there, what's your name? Hello, I'm Ryan. Uh, I'm of the uh, uh, Tacoma uh, Commodore Users Group. Uh, they're actually the Puget Sound Commodore Users Group. Uh, what are you doing with your exhibit here? Well, I've got um, an SX64 running Prince of Persia mm. on a, uh, an Easy Flash cartridge there. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, um, I, I was running um, Sonic the Hedgehog on this 128D. Uh, we were swapping monitors, sorry about all that static earlier, that was uh, the problem. And uh, on this pet here, I've got a game called Dungeon, which was uh, highlighted by uh, Robin of, uh, yeah, 8-bit uh, show and tell. Huh. Yeah, uh, it's got a little run the guy around and try to uh, avoid monsters and collect treasure and stuff. <laughs> Got this um, IEEE uh, MSD2 drive that uh, connects to the pad and this uh, SFD1000 drive that also has an uh, IEEE connector on it, but we're not sure if it works yet. Are these other computers uh, yours also over here on this side? Uh, this is a Commodore Colt, and that's Devon's. Oh, okay. I'll ask um, Devon. Yeah. That's uh, my stuff. Yeah. Oh. It's uh, not working yet, but hopefully we'll be able to get it working at some point. Kind of a interesting thing to have running. I guess it's MS-DOS compatible, as far as I know. Yeah, it is a... Yeah? It's a AD... AD88. Yeah. PC so, yeah. circa 1989, yeah. and that version is a Colt uh, 10.3 with a hard drive in it. Cool. Hmm. Um, and actually, I lucked out because I have a board on watch. It's literally the same exact board as that one. So I will save that as a spare, and there you go. I will replace it with. One and hope to have that working in the next few weeks. Oh wow, there you go. So, oh, oh okay, so I'm switching over. What's your name again? My name is Devin. Hi Devin. Uh, hi. And, uh, why did you come to the show this this time? Well, I found out actually from um, the Puget Sound uh, retro community group uh, about, the, about the show and I didn't know it existed. So I was like, being the Commodore kind of retro nerd I am, I decided to come up and check it out, and it's been a lot of fun. This is my very first one. Uh, again, I didn't know there was such a thing. I thought they were all kind of towards California or <laughs> further east. So this has been a fun experience. Are you just here to uh, repair computers? Um, I was actually 
uh, here to kind of look and see what was going on to check out the uh, Mega 65 project and all the other uh, um, other cool little things that are going around. I have quite a few of the machines that I see here because I a collector user, so was able to get some information on the the ones that I um, I have, and I'll probably end up ordering a Mega 65 <laughs> because. Yeah, it was just a really cool project, so that's kind of one of the ones that I've been wanting to uh, get my hands on. I didn't realize it was so far, uh, it was so far developed, so I was going to have to wait a year to get it. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. It's nice talking. Hi there, what's your name? Hey, I'm Rob Barlow, and I am demonstrating uh, a lot of things that have been uh, supplemented our hobby via 3D printing. So, if you take a look at these monitors, for example, uh, these are fully functional monitors tuned for use with retro systems like the uh, Amigas and the Commodore 64, uh, but they also have HDMI modern input so they can be used with things like the C64 Mini, C64 Maxi, the A500. Uh, and these are things that you can make yourself. <laughs> no, I can't make that. <laughs> uh, uh, and and you have here your uh, that's C64 a, Mini. Yeah, that's a C64 Mini. Uh, that monitor is um, is just an off-the-shelf monitor that's been rehoused in a uh, 1702 style case. So pretty much hollow inside. And then. Um, there are people on uh, there are people on Thingiverse. There are people on YouTube. There are people all over doing all sorts of cool mods for this. So this is a um, a fifteen forty one case around a um, an external USB drive. Oh. The disc inside is formatted as uh, in such a way that it's seen by the system as a USB device, <laughs> and so you can load your files onto there, and you can use it as if you were using a USB stick. Amazing, amazing! And the, your your fifteen forty one mini here has a fully depressible keyboard, right? Yeah, the the sixty four mini the keyboard is functional. Uh, you can actually, yeah, you can actually type. You could program on it if you felt like it. Uh, wouldn't recommend it, but it can be done. It's amazing. And how long did it take you to like design that? Well, I'm not the original designer, so there was a guy in the UK uh, who designed the PCB. Uh, he's the one who, uh, using 3D model keycaps, oh. uh, and um, he designed it initially. What they were doing, uh, you might have seen this. They were taking the the keyboard, which is just a you know a fixed piece. And they were like cutting the back off. What? That would result in a bunch of keys, right? Yeah. Um, that wasn't a great way to do it. So he ended up modeling each key individually and 3D printing them with resin. So, uh, and then to finish them, you color them the way you like. Uh, in this case, to get that double shot keycap appearance, uh, we've got this hardening clay um, hmm. to make those legends. So that's kind of in the in the divots. Um, and then, unfortunately, there is not a place you can buy these. You got to do it yourself. So you've got to solder the board. You got to like huh. you know, got to flash the. Actually, you might so pre flash it, but you got to flash the little Arduino inside. You got to do the wiring into a hub and all that. Kind of so, um, and I have to say, oh. I did melt one or two components doing that, so um, not not a good first project, perhaps. But uh, <laughs> but once you get it done, uh, it's satisfying just to have like this right. kind of functional right. dollhouse esque right. system. And this little uh, pet here is just just three D printed right here. Yeah, this is just another example of something that can be done with three D printing as more just a hobby or a kind of a kinetic sculpture. This Ooh. actually does have a functional screen, right? If you look, what? it's it's got a Raspberry <laughs> Pi. I can even pry it open. Hang on, <laughs> give me a second here. I can pry it open like a real uh, pet, and you can <laughs> see the see the guts inside. Just as if it was a real pet. Yeah, amazing. Wait a minute. You don't have the rod, the, the rod to hold open oh, the, that's the true. garage door. It seems to be out. Door. Yeah, you're right. You need so, the rod. <laughs> um, so there is actually a keyboard for this as well. Uh, somebody's actually made a, a functional fully keyboard. fully functional keyboard yeah. for something that small? So you put a Raspberry <laughs> Pi in here, you put the little keyboard in here, uh, and you can actually have, and you know, obviously you're going to put a pet emulator on here. Right. You can actually have a pet uh, in that scale. That's amazing. Very, very amazing. And how much did your 3D printer here uh, cost, or for you to build or make? I would say I would guess just like a hundred bucks in parts. Um, and as far as the as far as the assembly goes, 
Uh, this is a RepRap printer, so it was it was printed by another printer, right? So that's that's the idea <laughs> oh, behind it, right? The, this concept of using a printer to print another printer. Well, that uh, sounds like they're replicating. The robots are replicating. Yeah, RepRap. <laughs> that's that's what it stands for. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, bye. Hi there. You like hey? Hey, you, uh, what's your name? Uh, my name is Dan Sanderson. I am uh, uh, here uh, with my Mega 65 computer. And what are you doing with your Mega 65 right now? Well, right now I'm uh, working on something that I was uh, planning on giving a talk on later today. It's not done yet, so it might just, I might just sit here and play with it a little bit. Um, uh, this is actually an implementation of Conway's Game of Life. Uh, for the Mega 65, wow. um, which is a, a cellular automata program. Uh, this is a uh, this version is kind of a slow version written in BASIC uh, um, with some upgrades uh, that I was planning on adding later. But uh, um, you can see this. I can uh, try running it real quick. It's uh, not particularly <laughs> impressive yet because I've just been sitting here typing it. But uh, uh, if I uh, did it correctly, uh, a game of life. Here's a yeah. very simple game of life pattern, yeah. and you can see it uh, change uh, between its two different states as it evolves over time. It's growing. Uh, yes. Uh, this particular pattern doesn't grow very much. It just sits there and blinks back and forth. <laughs> but uh, that's my test pattern for this. So. And, 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 and why are you doing this? Uh, I uh, was planning on giving a talk on this later today. I'm not done with it yet, so maybe I won't, but uh, I am going to give a talk on this uh, next weekend at Megavision, which is an online conference for uh, the Mega 65. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. We're back with Ryan of the uh, Pacific uh, Pacific Puget Sound uh, Commodore Colors. User Group. Ryan, hi. Ryan, show us what you have. Well, um, this is really new to me, so apologies for any uh, mistakes or whatever, but this is something for the 128 called uh, Triangle Micro OS, I believe. Um, and it was, I think, just released. So it's a miniature operating system written entirely in uh, basic 7.0 and we're gonna watch it boot up here uh, 1.35 yep, that's the newest version and and some sort of structural features on the setup loading and it's uh, joystick driven. I don't know if it supports a mouse, but it's uh, here's the desktop. We've got uh, system information here, some games, apps, and settings, uh, a clock. I don't know what that is yet. Um, so let's see. There's a little Sim City type game here that might be. Kind of fun. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, are the windows movable? Uh, that I don't know. Yeah. I thought the windows uh, were supposed to be movable. If you, if you, yeah. let's see. holding down the fire button. Uh, no, that just redraws the window. <laughs> okay. So they, they may be. I don't know yet. Uh, but this Sim City, I mean, it, it's pretty impressive for uh, being written in Basic 7.0. Oh um, wow! I actually have a copy of the original Sim City 1.0 written by. Uh, Right huh. uh, for the 64, and that's that's pretty cool. That's a high res game, but this is just text mode. Um, so F1 to start, and wherever you move the mouse pointer, you can um, space will lay down some road, and then R. On the keyboard is for uh, residential zone. Uh, yeah. hmm. and let's see. It may take more money than I have because that goes down. Um, let's see. There's a real population, so they're not bringing in any taxes. 
Maybe commercial is cheaper. Hmm, I don't remember the prices of stuff. Uh, but it was kind of funny. I was letting it sit idle during Stephen's talk earlier, and it was building up money from finally bringing people in. And uh, anyway, um, let's see. Let me try some industrial. Let's see. Maybe I have to move the. Alrighty, so um, actually we've uh, just restarted the system and I'm going to take a look at a shooter called uh, Star Wars. And here we have the crawl text. <laughs> oh, look at that. Yep. Just one of them gone. Yeah. The program won't be eating fast. Yesterday was a no eating day. Oh, wow. This is the compiled That's a pretty good one. Right. Ready? Oh, look at that. Instruction. Yep. Okay. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> so the TIE Fighter moves pretty fast, but your targeting doesn't move fast. Really slow, yeah. Um, fire. Oh. oh. At least you can move no, diagonally. So it's like yeah. Not really yeah, if if the uh, target moved at the same speed as your crosshairs, that would be good. Get it. Oh. oh. Nice. Wow. Uh, it gives you. Yes. I got it. Okay. And then you've got fuel ticking down there too. Oh, That's see, I didn't, I didn't see that. Wait a minute, fuel? They have yeah, fuel? I guess. In Star Wars, they I, have. I guess. <laughs> when, when they, I don't remember them having fuel concerns in Star Wars. Yeah, I know. Nobody has any fuel yeah. in Star Wars. They have infinite, infinite power for all their spaceships. Yeah. Ooh, he got one! Yay! Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, you're welcome.